This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. The first time I tried my hand at fiction in high school, it was a way of dealing with people and issues that I couldn't handle in real life. So I killed the people off in brutal fashion and made the issues go away. My friends thought it was hysterical and that I was a little twisted. In college, I again used fiction writing for my personal aims, this time to deal with my frustrating inability to get laid as a freshman at the University of Miami. I thought it might be a way of leveling the playing field. It didn't change my virginal status, but as the manuscript was handed around the dormitory, I earned a different kind of reputation. I was the guy who remembered and chronicled all the stuff that happened when everyone else was falling down drunk. And I was the guy who, if you messed with me, would get even with you at the typewriter. My father once said to me, nothing bad will ever happen to you because you'll just write about it and get even. And isn't that what the power of the press is all about? 25 years later, I read the latest novel by Tim Dorsey. Hurricane Punch reminded me of, well, me. As I turned the pages and read about people being barbecued by military me meals ready to eat lasagna, or being fried by the world's most powerful guitar amp, I remembered the thrill of brutalizing the people I thought were idiots or who'd done me wrong. Dorsey, who's joining us today, as a former journalist who made it out alive, having worked at the Tampa Tribune from 1987 until 1999. Hurricane Punch, which was published in February 2007, is Dorsey's ninth novel. It's an all-too-funny story about life in the world's emerging media capital, Tampa Bay, during hurricane season. It skewers the media left and right, which made it perfect for discussion here. Tim, welcome to Mr. Media. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, and not to make your interview all about me, Tim, but am I the only one who thinks fiction writing is a great place for vengeance? Um, actually, uh, I think maybe that's the chord that I've struck. It's a lot broader <laughs> than, uh, than I, I think even my publisher or my agent thought. Um, I, it, originally, I, I guess it was presumed that these would be more of a cult or, or underground type thing, but... Um, I mean, it, just if you look at my website, uh, you know, the pictures of my audiences, I mean, they, they look like the, the local neighborhood association. <laughs> so I, well, I have a theory about that, and, yeah. I, and that is that um, even more so than, than your background and mine, I think out there there's this like, kind of untapped reservoir of, uh, I guess, this feeling that um, all the people that obey the rules and, uh, you know, and are, are good pillars of the community, it's... It, there's a growing resentment that uh, the people who are breaking the rules are, are winning. And so uh, maybe vicariously through Surge and, and the books, they, uh, they see these, uh, the, these miscreants uh, <laughs> getting their just desserts. I was kind of reminded of uh, uh, the Zach Braff character on Scrubs who is dealing with real life, but he thinks, and you always see what's actually going on in his head and what he'd like to do and how he'd like to deal with the person. And that's pretty much what Serge does. I mean, he, he, just, he just deals with the way he wants to. He doesn't seem to filter things like the rest of us do. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the best part of doing this is, is um, it's, it's a matter of not censoring your imagination. And I think we all have this sort of stream of consciousness to one degree or another where as we go through uh, the day, uh, we have this internal dialogue, and uh, that's it. It's basically he just is externalizing our, you know, collective internal dialogue. I think. Now, uh, I don't mean to be so heavy about it, <laughs> but, but really, it's, that's, I mean, we all have these these little voices and these little things going on as we drive around and we curse at people on the highway and. Anyway. Oh, absolutely. Well, I was going to ask you. I mean, it seems like there's a little passive aggressive streak uh, at work with the author here. Oh, a absolutely, and um, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I started off, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and, and I have a great temper, as probably as a result of the books. But I was uh, uh, at, at the beginning, I guess maybe there was a lot of bottled up uh, uh, frustration that ended up, uh, you know, coming out as, as Serge's uh, violent streak. And then as I got, uh, you know, as my dreams came true, and I got books published and sales started going up and royalty started going up you know i became quite happy and the people started complaining that surge wasn't killing enough people and they were you know criticizing the book so they pissed me off and i killed more people <laughs> and uh, 
you know, a, a lot of what happens uh, happens on the road uh, in d- different places. And I, I got to wondering if I, I saw that you have done well over 800 personal appearances for the books over the years. Do you uh, do you find yourself hatching up ways to uh, to kill people and uh, while you're out traveling? I mean. It, uh, but, uh, Yes, actually, uh, when I speak to writer groups, um, I, I explain that uh, most of my best writing is, and, uh, and I don't mean to be glib here, but it's done like in the shower or, or while driving. And what I mean by that is I don't sit down at the computer and think of what I'm going to write. I already pretty much know what I'm going to write by the time I sit down because I've kind of daydreamed it and you know, turned it over and visualized it in my head while mm. doing other stuff. Did uh, did you ever think that Surge was going to become, uh, I don't know if an alter ego, because, you know, hopefully you're not quite uh, like that, but, uh, I mean, did you think that you would be living with him ten years later? I, I, you know, I, I guess it's like like young people, um, you know, they just they don't look for the future. You know, if you're 18 or you're 21, you never think of being 25. It's like... When I started, you know, I just wanted to get one book published mm-hmm. and uh, and just be able to hold, you know, a hardcover with my name on it, you know, in my hand, and just and that would have just been, you know, like winning the lottery. And I I really didn't think beyond that, um, but uh, it just yeah, it just took off. And uh, you know, like I mentioned, I ended up connecting on levels that uh, my publisher and and, and my, I didn't necessarily expect. Mm. Now, you, you and I have never met or uh, officially crossed paths, but I was actually at the Tampa Tribune in '86. And yeah, last I came in '87. '87, right? And uh, it, it wasn't hard for me to imagine uh, a couple of things while reading uh, Hurricane Punch. One is, uh, I guess, by the time you were writing the book, you were a copy editor by then. You were no, you were no longer out uh, uh, working a beat. But I, I know that room that you were in. <laughs> and I know what had been going on uh, in the years leading up to that. I mean, it, 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 you, there, you make reference in the novel a lot to convergence, and um, I can just imagine a copy editor sitting around daydreaming about other things, or, or, or you know, uh, am I wrong? Or is this what's going on? Doing doing anything but the work I was paid to do. Right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> if, um, I, well, I. Actually, I was. It was it's interesting. Um, as I was working on uh, the very first book, which was Florida Roadkill, um, I would. Uh, I, I wasn't. And the thing is, the way this evolved was, I wasn't going to have violence or crime or anything in the books. I was just going to have satires on Florida because um, I felt that you know I don't know. I just felt maybe that would be a crutch, but <laughs> it's been a great crutch. Um, I. Uh, I finally had an epiphany that uh, you know basically the uh, the crime and, and all of the news stories that I've covered either as a reporter or an editor, you know it's what I know and uh, and I had a, a, a large tank of material uh, to tap into and mm-hmm. so uh, so I, I would be I'd be working and uh, I mean I, I left uh, when the, the day literally the day the first book got published is when I left the Tribune and. Mm-hmm. While I was working on that first book, um, you know, I was writing it at home. Uh, but you know, as you know, as you, when you write something, you know, it's constantly, uh, you know, even though you have an outline, it changes as you go along. And each shift at the paper, you know, whatever my imagination m- might have thought up, you know, quite often uh, reality would trump it. You know, <laughs> something would come over the AP wire, or the cop reporter would come over and uh, you know and tell me something he just uh, you know an arrest report he just picked up. And you know, I would uh, slide open my drawer and get my notepad and <laughs> make it up for the next chapter. <laughs> so you, you you didn't actually write this at work? I'm I'm very disappointed to hear that. Oh, Hurricane Punch? Yeah, no, I mean uh, uh, Florida Roadkill. I was really hoping to hear that you wrote it, you know, in between stories at the at the trip. Oh no, no, no! I, I actually, and I'm not saying this <laughs> defensively. Like, I really didn't. I, I took I would take notes. Of you know, I would take shorthand notes if I saw um, a news story come across that I thought I could use. But uh, mm. but no, no, I did this, um, and I worked the night desk. So if I, you know, I would think about it at work. But uh, you know, I would come home and write, you know, late into the night after the night shift, or get up early. And uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, one of those sort of med student, you know, residency uh, crucibles that you've got to survive. Mm. 
uh, you know, pulling the double shift like that. But uh, you, um, that's what you get. That's, you know, nobody has time to write a book. You know, but you just got to do it. You know, while juggling the other job. Mm-hmm. You uh, you used up an awful lot of uh, pop culture and, and uh, Florida news references in this book. I was amazed. It seemed like every time I turned a page, it's like, oh right, there's Terry Schiavo. Or the, you know, uh, did you did you did you use too many? Were you not? Did you, did you really have enough for the next book? Um, I'll tell you, I've got a stack of newspapers right next to me here in my office, and you know. <laughs> it, it, it's it's a it's like a conveyor belt. It, I never use it up. You know, remember remember the Lucille Ball episode with the cream pies coming down. It's like you're never going to run out of weird news stories in Florida. You, you know there will always you know be uh, you can't get enough books out. Frankly, and you must get asked about this a lot. What is it about Florida? I mean, you know, uh, uh, we certainly have this whole Florida fiction uh, genre now. Uh, yourself and Hyacinth and others, uh, and then then there's things like. Uh, uh, my friend Chuck Shepard, who does the News of the Weird column, is, is actually – there's so much that happens in Florida on a regular basis. He does a whole separate thing called the F State. Uh, yeah, it's um, – well, I think that uh, – well, first, uh, as far as the genre, um, and this goes to another question that people ask as far as, you know, the – what is it with the journalists, you know, you know, so uh, you know, heavily populating uh, that, that school of writing. Um, and the, the questions answered – self there that uh, you know, the ones who just you know read uh, the news you know especially the, the stuff the little stuff in the wires that doesn't necessarily make the paper all those little tidbits um, you know that that's responsible uh, you know for the genre but basically the, the journalists um, and then the other part as far as why it's so odd um, I, I just think it's, it's a combination of of the weather and the lack of uh, control of the state. I mean, basically, it, it's, uh, you know, there's a robust, uh, you know, business and economy, but nobody's really running things, you know, in the overall sense. You know, it's not, you know, uh, everything's up for grabs. And there's such growth and uh, and, and transiency of, of population that you know, people just pass each other, and uh, it's very easy for, uh, you know, for somebody who's on the lam or, or doing no good to sort of you know, blend in or hide in the cracks. Oh, and Sir certainly does that. I mean, that's amazing. Did you, um, is he, is is the character today, is he different than the than the way he started 10 years ago? I mean, you said you didn't plan on all the, the violence and, and mayhem that way, but are there other aspects of him that are different, or is he pretty consistent 10 years out? You know, I, I I think he's probably uh, a lot different, um, not, and not not by plan or, or anything, but simply, uh, you know, unconsciously. As uh, you know, if you write over the course, I mean, if I just if I look back, you know, over, you know, a nine year span of when I was working for you know newspapers, and I took you know clips that I wrote at the beginning and clips at the end, you know, there's a difference in writing, and I I just think. Just the inevitable, you know, and as I said, you know, unconscious changes in your writing as you're going along will affect, uh, you know, the characters. Mm. And uh, Hurricane Punch, in particular, uh, is as much about Surge as it is about the media, the, the Tampa Bay media in particular. W- was that aspect of it too easy to write and parody? Uh, the media part? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, that was... It, that that's the thing that, uh, as far as this book, that was the most uh, was, was one of the easiest to write, and and therefore one of the uh, most fun, and, uh, and I, I and I think that helped the book. I think if if you're if it's work and you're not enjoying it, um, I think that that will that will show up in the final product. But uh, no, this was this was a blast. It seemed like uh, Jeff McSwirly, and I love that name. Uh, who's the uh, the the, uh, the journalist in, in the book and one of the protagonists? He works for uh, not the Tampa Tribune or the St. Pete Times, but a third uh, Tampa Bay Daily. But I mean, it seemed to me that Tampa Bay Today, as, as it's called in the book, it really reminded me of the Tampa Tribune under Doral Harville, where I mean, that's when they were trying. Uh, there was that period of uh, oh, everything's all the convergence. We're going to do the internet here and. And we're gonna we, we brought the TV station in, and we're gonna do news. And uh, am, am I wrong? Um, 
I think I think timeline wise it was a little later. Okay. And but no, I mean you, you're accurate in in that it was a um, in that it, it was it, it was an industry wide movement and mm-hmm. the Tribune was part of it. But the one thing I want to stress uh, by having a fictitious third party newspaper is that there are places that have taken it to the extreme, and I didn't want to say that it was a Tribune because it's not. It, okay. But you know my my experiences you know in the media. Um, you know, got to be there because uh, I mean, frankly, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I like what I'm. I mean, this is what I intended to do all along, but I really love working at the Tribune, and, and you know, and all, and I have so many friends there, and uh, and they and they've gotten a kick out of this because uh, um, you know they they're all in the media and they they've, they've seen you know what's happened and stuff like that, and so uh, so this is kind of uh, I mean, ho- hopefully it's enjoyed. On a, on a uh, on a broad level, but I think journalists in particular uh, kind of uh, smile at the <laughs> at a lot of the references. It uh, it did seem more to me uh, reflective of the Tribune than in any way really the St. Pete Times, and I, I just assumed that that was mostly because well, of course you worked at the Tribune and the trip. Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, you know, if I'm if I'm gonna like. Describe a newsroom or, or, or one of the uh, the news meetings or, or this or that. It's going to be either consciously or subconsciously uh, from you know the, the memories of where I worked. Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely. And I don't and and that my knowledge of, of the times is, is, is much less. Now, one of the great themes in the book, of course, is media convergence. The idea that uh, 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 McSwirley has a uh, an unused uh, video camera. Uh, in his bag at one point comes into into play. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, spell convergence for me and uh, use it in a sentence appropriate to the book. Spell convergence? Yes. <laughs> uh, now I'm trying to think of a joke here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's basically, uh, it's a convergence of... <laughs> I'm sorry, can we... Can we, can we... You want, to, you, want to, you want to skip the think of a glib line there. You want to you want to skip the spelling part. The, uh, the are you smart as a fifth grader part of the interview? Um, <laughs> no, I was. I actually. I was. I was just about to. I was about uh, one synapse away from a joke, and I couldn't make it oh. in, in real time there. So, it is is convergence a, a, a bad thing? Do you think as you as you think about it and you look on it? Um, not not in concept, but it can be in execution. I mean, if it's um, if, in concept, it can be great. And, uh, and I know now we're playing inside baseball with a lot of people who aren't. I know. Here. But um, but if it's simply used as a cost cutting measure to to get get more work out of less people, then then it's terrible because um, in a lot of respects, uh, media uh, tend to be. Uh, Natural monopolies or, or semi-natural monopolies, and and there there used to be some. And I know this isn't business, you know. We're we're uh, it's a capitalist country, you know, which is great. But um, there used to be a, a, a sort of tacit contract with the community that we would fulfill uh, a function of you know casting light on politicians and you know the the powerful elite who would prefer to uh, you know, have their business done you know behind doors. And uh, and and it's not that we're. I guess the less ex- the fewer people you have, and the less experienced they are in, in investigative reporting, um, the more that that uh, that function doesn't get uh, performed. Mm. So that that's my concern. Um, I know that sounds very dry. And, <laughs> and I'm beating my chest hot, you know. But uh, <laughs> well, you can only you can only respond to the questions that are thrown at you. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, hurricanes, of course, play a very big part. Uh, in in the book and and for people who haven't haven't read it yet the title is hurricane punch and there's obviously there's a tropical drink on the cover of the the, the hardcover but i mean the book is really uh, about a, a a guy who loves the thrill of the hurricanes and also the media coverage of hurricanes uh do you have any good uh, personal hurricane stories have you been evacuated for example um the absolutely, and as a matter of fact, that's how the book uh, came about. Oh. I, mean, I was, I was, uh, um, you know, getting ready to write that book, and I was I was working on the outline uh, of a book that had certain elements, but non-hurricane elements of it, and that was in the 2004 season. Little did I know that 2005 was just around the corner. But mm-hmm. what happened was, as I was starting to write the book, I, I couldn't get it on track because it was uh, 
we were literally constantly, you know, uh, either evacuating. We have uh, relatives uh, in, in Vera Beach, and either they were evacuating over here or we were evacuating over there, like, constantly, you know, mm. constantly, you know, getting supplies, putting down shutters, putting up shutters, you know, <laughs> zipping across the state, you know, taking in relatives, you know, it, and it, it was, uh, it, it became... Um, it became just a routine lifestyle, and uh, and and then you know during that I'm a news junkie, so I always have I always have CNN or, or MSNBC or something on, and and during that whole period I was I was also bombarded with the just the surrealness of of uh, reporters covering hurricanes. You know I mean. Either they're standing out where nothing is happening and trying to make it exciting, or they're brainlessly standing where they should never be. <laughs> and so anyway, it was just uh, it was uh, it, it was just um, how my life was during uh, the writing of that book. Which which we were ext- by the way we were extremely lucky. I mean we uh, we dodged my family dodged a lot of bullets. Uh, my in laws from Vero Beach got clobbered a couple times. They lost electricity for, for, for weeks, uh, roof, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, over here we did we did exceptionally well. Oh, yeah. I, we had a similar experience here in that you know, we were, I, I think, for about six weeks, we had a good deal of our stuff packed in the back of a, a, a U-Haul trailer, and we're set to go at any minute to, to leave. And the time we finally were evacuated, I remember we, we went to Ocala, which is about 90 miles uh, north of here, S- seemed to be quite safe. And then suddenly the, the one hurricane was headed towards us there, and my family in Sanford, Florida, my, my wife's family, uh, invited us and said, well, come here. We're safe here. And we said, no, you know what? It's too late. We're going to stay here. And they got hit. So yeah, it, I mean, the, the book on that level was just—it's uh, so dead on to the experience, both the, the you know the way people react and, and the way you're completely powerless, but also the media coverage of the storms is just. Uh, and, and, it is, and I don't know. I, and frankly, as being still in the media, I don't know how they would do it any differently because you got to go and plant yourself at a place and think you're, you're either going to get great footage or nothing's going to happen. And but you're still there, and you got to report. And I, you capture that so well. I, I, it was one of the things I really loved about the book is that it's just it's inane, but it's necessary. <laughs> well, what, what killed me is I would uh, there was the uh, I think it was from the 2005 series. Um, uh, or season where uh, uh, Key West, uh, I, I guess Key West got brushed. I mean, they, I mean, they, they had massive damage from the storm surge uh, as a storm that really didn't hit them wind wise. But as it went by, uh, the surge backwashed on them, and they really got hurt. But uh, but during a lot of the footage uh, of the, of that, then a couple storms that brushed them. I mean, and you know, I mean, if you know Key West, you know it's. You can predict this. If they would be, you know, a reporter out there, you know, on live TV, and and they would be just like, you know, people walking behind them with drinks, you know, out <laughs> right. in the monsoon, and, and it was just a scream. All right, absolutely. Um, you uh, change the subject just slightly. Uh, you, I, I, I mentioned that you have done something like eight hundred personal appearances. And you've obviously gotten very good at it. If people go to timdorsey.com, your website, they can they can see uh, that you have uh, hats and T-shirts for Surge and for the books. And I mean, it's become a whole little cottage industry. Do you like the appearances, and how do you make them? How do you make them work so well for you? Um, I, I it, it's it's interesting that the appearances have become. At first, I was. Uh, you know, you have to try to sell your name and, and, and all that, and that was just like you know meeting with a bunch of friends each place I go, and so you just get together and, and have fun, and you, and you know how it is when you have your, your certain group of friends, and basically the people you end up friends with are the ones with similar senses of humor. Mm. I mean, just after just spending enough time, you know, each time you get together with some friends, you just start cracking up over stuff. You throw out, you know, and uh, and with these books, it kind of brings out people of like uh, like minds when it when it comes to humor, and so we just get together and just you know uh, I just have discussions and uh, and we end up cracking each other up and uh, and they give me a lot of great material. <laughs> we had a good time this last tour with, uh, with with a lot of the current news that was going on, but uh, but uh, 
if, if anything, the uh, the readers make it work because you know it's uh, you know they're they're already pulling for me and, and they want to talk about old Florida and, uh, <laughs> and Surge, of course, the people that they love that he's pumped off. Do you uh, do you remember the first time someone showed up with a uh, with the S uh, tattoo? Um, you know these. Um, I have had a couple of uh, yeah, a couple of people have been surge tattooed, and they've, they've emailed me the, uh, uh, <laughs> the their photos. The, the one I specifically remember was at a book signing where um, I didn't see the person until the person in front of them had their book signed, and then they stepped. The next person stepped up in line, and if you know the books, you know that uh, he it was a guy, and he was dressed in a blue NASA astronaut jumpsuit and he was carrying a silver briefcase and uh, of course you know <laughs> that's surge you know? so, um that that was great and then i had um in uh in southern palm beach county at a barnes and noble just on this last tour i had uh two women show up one was um uh, sharon the stripper from florida roadkill and the other was yeah. molly uh the love interest in torpedo juice wow yeah they showed up, and one had like a bag of white powder. And, I mean, it was just crazy. <laughs> now, has there been uh, has there been any interest, or have you optioned any of these yet? Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we currently have an option. Um, we've optioned Florida Roadkill, um, which uh, essentially means that they have dibs on the uh, on the series because the way it works is if you have a a character throughout the books, they have uh, they're entitled to you know, any of the other books if they want to use material. Is there any activity on the option? Uh, you know, I, it's uh, I, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, they then this is the third time we've optioned it, and then and you can option it a million times, and they don't make it, or just out of the blue one day you hear they're about to go into production. So right. Um, but I'm so busy with the books, I don't check with them, and I'm I guess they're glad because I you know I don't know how other authors are, but I'm, I'm sure they don't want to be bothered by the guy who wrote the thing. They just want to. It, it would seem, you know, in reading, it would seem to to make it would make a great uh, series, like on a Showtime or HBO, where they could deal with the, the themes as opposed to you know. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you'd be thrilled to have a movie made, but it's, it, I mean, it just the material would really lend itself to an adult type of ongoing. Uh, program I would thought. Well, I won't argue with anything they'd like to <laughs> I got you. Now um, I understand that the uh the paperback edition of Big Bamboo is due out but any day or is it out? It just it literally just came out, so okay. yes, you're 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 correct. All right, so we're right on top of that. And uh you finished the next book, number ten? Yes. Does it have a title? It has it, it not no not not in stone. I've got, I've got a couple things I'm playing with, but uh, it, as in the past, if I cast something aside, I might use it two or three books down the road. So uh, okay. no, we don't have a finalized title yet. And I, I, it's the untitled book number eleven. Is that we're uh, is that we're talking about it? Oh, is that one number eleven? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I guess I'm I got my count wrong. So so Hurricane Punch was number ten. Hurricane Punch. I apologize. <laughs> you, I'm literally I'm on the computer screen in front of me is number eleven. Ah, <laughs> that's number ten. Number ten's done, and I'm working on number eleven. Okay, so my count my count is right. Your count. Your see, this is this is yes. <laughs> you are correct. Uh, can you tell us anything? That's what happens when you get because literally because of the long lead time. You've got pretty much three going on, you know, constantly. You know, one you're either wrapping up or touring for, uh, one that's you know being edited, and then the next one you're writing. That's a good. It's a good thing to know what you're doing next. Now, is is there anything you can tell us about number ten, including when it'll be out, but also you know what what you know what direction? Surge? Well, it'll be out um, next uh, uh, January, and it, it takes place. There's a lot of other parts of Florida, but it takes place uh, uh, quite a bit in the Tampa Bay area. And it uh, it follows uh, Surge and Coleman are back uh, for those who follow the the series, and it's um, it also reunites. And you don't have to know any previous books; each one should stand alone. But if anybody has read uh, Triggerfish Twist, which was another Tampa Bay book, um, it picks up with a lot of those characters, uh, reunites them because I, I I enjoyed that that storyline and those characters. Mm. I know that was always the great thing I loved about the John McDonald book years ago, which took place in Florida. That uh, even though the character in the, the one series was recurring, you could pick up any book, 
and, and, and get into it and know what was going on. And I, I think you're right. I mean, it's the same thing with, with these books. Um, uh, any other hint of what's going to happen that you want to tease a little bit? Is there an Evelyn Wood version of... Uh, oh, let me let me think here. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, for those... Uh, for those who are familiar with the series, um, uh, Coleman will finally meet Lenny and uh, Johnny Vegas. The Accidental Virgin is back by popular <laughs> demand. I actually get—it's funny—I go, I go on the book tour and I almost feel like an oldies rock act. You know, little call-out requests, you know, for the next book. You know, <laughs> which character they want? You know, some of the uh, the supporting cast they want back. So those guys are back. Uh, the uh, the E team is back. The the older women. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, the Davenports are back. So, so is the uh, the DS brothers who uh, who are running the uh, the cheesy Hammerhead Ranch Motel uh, over in Pinellas. Mm-hmm. So you, uh, now, what about my, my my new favorite, Mr. Mick Swirly? Is he uh, is it too soon to bring him back? I, you know, I, there's a I don't want to give anything away, but they, right. I need a character. And I'm not sure which. Either I'm going to make a new character, or I'm going to bring back one of several. Mm. And he may. He's in the running, but uh, but he might be a dark horse at this point. I uh, and, and again, without giving anything away, I just want to say I loved the ending on Hurricane Punch. I, I completely, I, I had a, a sense of where it might go, but I was completely surprised in, in the way it wound up. So, good job there. <laughs> oh well, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, uh, Tim, uh, we're just about out of time, so I want to thank you very much for joining us in Mr. Media this week. Well, I, well, I appreciate it very much too. And. Um, uh, folks, uh, first of all, you can uh, learn more about Tim and his work at uh, timdorsey.com. And if you'd like to keep up with Mr. Media's Friday interviews, you can subscribe to the site via email at www.mrmedia.com. You can also subscribe to the audio feed in the podcast section of iTunes. Thanks for joining us. Please come back next week for another Fridays with Mr. Media. <laughs>